confess my sins to you. You are faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Oh God, we thank you for this second Advent church. Thank you for this pastor, God. Thank you for these people. God, we thank you for the relationship that we have right now. God, we pray a special prayer over their lives right now, God, that whatever they are lacking, God, that you would give increase. God, whatever there is aid, God, that you would remove it, God, whatever there may be disbelief, that you would give us the faith. God, bless your word on this morning. Speak to your people. God, my prayer right now that as I stand, you would speak. God, use me. I'm a willing vessel to speak to your people. Soft and hearts that they can receive your word. But God, leave this place better than they were when they came in. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said amen. 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 If you love the Lord, give him a hand and praise and if you make some prayer. God is great, and he is greater to be praised. Amen, amen. I believe that um, when we come into the house of God, man, it doesn't matter what it is that we all going through at this present moment, but I believe that when you begin to think, that's when you automatically should think. Because when you think of how good he has been or is being to you right now, I believe that sometimes hands are automatically just go over and say, God, thank you. Amen, amen, amen. It's not, it, it doesn't show how spiritual or unspiritual you may be, but it's all depending on your own personal views and relationship of the God that you serve. Man, if you think your God is not worthy to be praised, then you don't pray. But if you know that your God is worthy of you, that every chance that you get, you ought to be willing to let somebody around you Know that God is worthy to be praised. Amen. To my good friend, Pastor Clement Hall, thank you again for this opportunity. Amen. I thought about that on my way over here. I said, either one or two things, either I do a right preaching, or I'm so bad that you just feel sorry for me when you give me another chance. <laughs> Amen. I go with the first one. All right, man. Let's do it. To all of y'all, I mean, every time I come, you all make me feel as if I'm one of y'all, and I really do appreciate that. Amen. Hey, y'all, I have my shadow. Hey, Amen. That's my son. He's back there. Hey, Amen. I see you got the iPad up. I take that in court, man. <laughs> but it's all good. But that's my son back there. That's my only begotten son. Hey, Amen. I tell anybody, if I, if I go to war for anybody, that's the one I know to war for. Hey, Amen. Um, you're being Pastor Clinton. Pastor Paul was talking in the back, and we were sharing that on, on, the, on the days after the, the, the things happened in Ferguson and in New York, that sometimes the preachers, well, some preachers felt obligated to address the situation, and I don't really address it in a sense, but as I, I thought about it, and I look at him oftentimes, it, you know, I, it would be hard to put myself in that situation of those parents that lost their child or lost their loved one in the hands of someone else. But I teach my son. That if you right. do right, I believe that God will continue to do right. Don't put yourself in a position to where somebody has to make a judgment over your life. Amen. That's why I, I, y'all, I'm old school. If the street lights come on, you in the house. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I don't like all that in, in, in the dark activity because, you know, strange things happen in the dark. I'm talking to some grown folk in there, too. I'm talking about I'm real good. But that one, I have, God has, uh, I'm, God has given me the opportunity to be a good steward over that. And I think it's my job to be a good steward over my son. So I know he might think daddy mean at times, but daddy love him. Yes. Amen. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm going to do with the fun, the guidance of God, the best thing possible for my child. Yes. And as parents, I hope you will be willing to do the same thing for your children. Amen. Amen. And kind of sort of that, I ain't say this is what I'm certainly going to deal with today, but you know, kind of sort of a whole as a church, amen, we need to understand that children are going to make mistakes, amen, and as adults or spiritual people, we need to learn how to handle the situations when they make mistakes, amen, 
And so if you don't mind, turn with me in your Bible to the book of St. John. And then the 8th chapter. St. John chapter 8. And we'll, we'll begin our reading in verse 2. And we'll conclude our reading in verse 11. And when you have it, say amen. And when you get there, you'll find these words. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes of Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very now in the law, Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? They were saying this, testing him, so that they may have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground. But when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone as the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you. Go, and from now on, and sin no more. And so, and for a subject we would like to use today, the sixth sense. You may be seeing the sixth sense. Y'all like to say, you know, I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm an epic movie watcher. I love movies. Love movies. I'm uh, I, I have a habit of sometimes going to the movie theater by myself catching a movie. If there's a movie that comes out that I want to see them. I love all kinds of movies, but uh, I take a particular interest in suspense horror. I mean, because I just love how something at the beginning of the movie you can't understand what's going on until you get to the end of the movie. And one of my favorite directors in this category is a guy named M. Night Shyamalan. And man, that is all. Uh, probably the most popular movement was The Sixth Sense. It's a movement that stars Bruce Willis, and Bruce Willis is this child psychiatrist. And the movie opens up where Bruce Willis is dealing with this boy that has a real bad issue, and Bruce Willis gets shot. And the movie uh, immediately propels itself to two months later. This time Bruce Willis is still in the movie, and he's dealing with a boy that has a whole other kind of issue. And this boy's issue was that he see dead people. And you know, Bruce Willis didn't really believe that the boy saw dead people, but as his psychiatrist, he tended to the boy anyway. And throughout the movie, you'll notice that Bruce Willis would go to parties and no one would interact with him. I mean, he sat down across from his table with his wife and he did all the talking and she did not respond. That's because once you get to the end of the movie, you'll find out through the whole movie that Bruce Willis is dead. And the boy actually was seeing a dead child psychiatrist. And sometimes we find ourselves just like Bruce Willis in this movie, how we can go into the room and you might try to be the life of the party but don't no one respond to you because spiritually you're dead. You can come to church oftentimes and the preacher tell you to lift your hand or the choir director tell you God's been good, stand to your feet and you just sit there. Because in the spiritual sense, you're literally dead. And some of the things that kill us is the lifestyle that we may live outside of this building or some of the things that we might be doing on the other hand. And that's why when we come into the house of the Lord, it's hard for us to interact with God on a spiritual level, which leaves us typically spiritual dead. But that's not the issue. The issue that I'm dealing with today is this sixth sense that this young boy has. You know that we've all been given five senses. That of sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell. But I was raised by my grandmother and my 
brother would often tell me that I didn't have common sense. And the sixth sense that I'm talking about today is common sense. And I find out the reason she said that I did not have common sense because me and my grandmother, when I was 10, 15 years old, did not think alike. So because she thought one way, and my thinking was another way, she would say, Arthur, you don't have any common sense. Because uh, I found out she was telling the truth. We didn't have, our thinking wasn't coming because she would tell me that when I get up in the morning to make up my bed, my thinking was, why well, make up the bed if I'm going to get back in it? We didn't, we was on the same line thinking. And I come to find out today that that is how we view each other in the church and the world. In the church, we say that people in the world, what they are doing just don't make good sense. And people in the world will look at us in the church and say that what we are doing just don't make good sense. It don't make sense for you to work five days a week and take care of all your business on Saturday and get up early on a Sunday morning and come into a church and worship a God that you ain't never seen. That don't make sense to people in the world. But to us, it don't make sense how they can just lay there in that bed and not get up and come to the house of God and give God praise and worship for the mighty things that he has done in our life. It don't make sense to people in the world for you to take your hard-earned money. And when a preacher say it's time to bless the Lord and worship giving, and you say that God will give you more if you give, that don't make sense to people in the world. But it don't make sense to us for them to sit there and not give God nothing since God has made them school. So the point that we want to make this morning is common sense. And what I find out the thing that makes the, the reason we can all agree on the same thing is because we have a common way of thinking. And there's only two ways you can think. Either you can think spiritually, and in this text we see that's what Jesus does, or you can think word. And that's what the church people do, or the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And my prayer today is that if you leave here today, if you have a worldly mentality that you would leave here and pray to God that God, you would take this worldly desire out of me and give me one that, that uh, is pleasing to you. For well, we know that the Bible teaches us that let this mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. I heard Pastor Hall get up and he made a plea. Uh, he was talking about how good the Sunday school lesson was. And, and I often go to churches and I hear a pastor or anyone say, won't you come out to Sunday school or won't you come out to Bible study? And I find out the reason that Sunday school and Bible study is important to us is because it has a way of putting the word of God in us. So that we can think like Jesus Christ. It is impossible for you to have the mindset of Christ Jesus if you don't know his word. You know, we were raised in the world. We know how to do it. <laughs> we know how to do this stuff. We know how to do all that other stuff that the world do because that is what we associate with all the time. But in order for us to get so much of this world out of us, we have to put the word of God on the inside of us. Y'all, I was talking to a friend I grew up with, and, 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 and an old song came on the radio, and both of us, this song was way out in the 90s, both of us was repeating word for word the lyrics of this song. And we called ourselves, and we like, man, how is it that we can remember this 20-year-old song, but when it comes to remembering scripture, we cannot. And we find out the reason is because we put time in and time in to remember things in the world, but when it comes to the word of God, we don't put in as much time. I work in a public shop, man. Guys can go in there and they can talk about Kobe Bryant only need uh, 30 points to pass up Michael Jordan. He got 30,000 points, played in the league 19 years, and been on one team forever. They can pull out all of Kobe Bryant's stats. They can talk about Michael Jordan. They can pull out all of Kareem's stats. And they know everything about everything, but when it comes to the Word of God, don't nobody know nothing. And what I find out is that if you just give God a few minutes of your day, in the same way that you can pull out all of that information about everything else, you can do the same thing with the Word of God. So, utilize the Bible study. Come to Sunday school and learn the Word of God so we can all be on the same accord with our thinking. That way the preacher will say that child will have common sense. But if my friend today that all of us have common sense, so it will make preaching a little bit easier for me today. Uh, to understand that there's a, a distinct difference in the way that Jesus handles this 
woman that's caught in adultery and the way that the world handles this woman that is caught in adultery. We all know people that have messed up in life. And the question on the table today is that when they have fallen or when they will fall, how do you respond to those that have made a mistake in life? Let's know that people are having premarital sex. People do watch pornography. They do spend time with themselves doing whatever it is they do. They men and women do cheat on their husband or wife. They do do that. People do steal. There are folks out there that are killing. But when it comes to the church, how do we respond to people like that? And Jesus shows us how we should respond because truth be told, this what this woman did in this day was a horrific deed. It is nothing that, 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 that you should smile upon than what she did, but because Jesus had so much love on the inside of him, the way he was put in a position to make a judgment on a woman that had done a horrific crime. You see the picture here, this woman, the Bible says she was caught in adultery. Not only did they, she was committing adultery, but the Bible says she was caught in the very act. That means that these church people walked in on her while she was doing the business. And they did not tell her, go in there, take a bath, put on your body fragrance, clean yourself up, get your hands and nails done, and we're going to take you to church. No, they didn't do that. They drugged her from doing what she was doing at three at the feet of Jesus. And asked the question of Jesus because they wanted, you know, Jesus' problem was not people in the world. His problem was with folk in the church because they were always opposing what he stood for. Jesus says, I didn't come to do away with the word, but I come that the word through me might be fulfilled. Uh, uh, and, 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 and they took uh, this, this new king literally to where they thought that someone would come and deliver them from Roman oppression. But Jesus didn't come that they can have freedom in this world, but he came that they can have freedom in their spiritual life. And Jesus here shows us, the church, how we should handle someone that has fallen. What I find out about people in the church is that we may confess Christ. But it just because you confess Christ does not mean that you possess Christ. And I believe that once you possess Christ, that's when Christ has reigns over your life and you have a desire. Not saying that you're going to get it right every time, but you have a desire in your mind to do the things that are pleasing to God. That's my son. I'm his father. I am the one that has authority over him. And because of that, hopefully his mindset is to do the things that will make that happen. And that is the same thing as children of God that we should do. Our actions should be the things that make God happy. Can I let somebody know? It does not make God happy for you to talk about people that fall. It does not make God happy for you to turn your back on people that have messed up in life. Because the question is that what if God would have turned his back on you? Because don't you know that none of us in here deserve to be in this place today? But because of God's tender mercies and his love and kindness that he has given us chance after chance after chance after chance to get it right with him. And if God can do that for us, how much more can we do that for our child and his best up? How much can we do for our father and our mother, even though they might not have God? Life out of this mouth. I mean, I mean, the power of life and death lies in the tongue. 
the most unruly member in your body, it is your tongue. Amen. So you need to think before you talk. I heard someone say that loose lips sink ships. And you know, it's been a whole lot of families that have separated. A whole lot of churches have parted ways. A whole lot of friendships have ended because of words that come out of people's mouth. And you must learn how to think before you talk. Look at here in the Bible. It says that after they brought this woman caught in the very act of adultery, they threw her at the feet of Jesus. And, and, and they asked Jesus, now, according to the law of Moses, that this woman should be stoned. What do you say? Jesus didn't immediately respond further. But in verse 6, at the end, it says, But Jesus stooped down and with his finger brought on the cross. Oh, in other words, Jesus didn't say a word. And I come to find out in my young life that the best thing to say sometimes is nothing. Sometimes we talk too much. When people bring you stuff about somebody else to gossip and to belittle someone, you don't have to respond. Matter of fact, you don't even much have to listen to that stuff. Because if it's not building up, it's tearing down. And it is not our place to tear down nobody with our mouth. Y'all, I've done a lot of damage with my mom. I'll be the first to admit, I mean, I mean I've been hurt. I mean, I mean, you know, you should have done me like that because you hurt me. I'm going to hurt you, and I know that sticks and stones may break your bones, the words will never hurt. I know that's a lot. Because I know that there's been some things that people said about me 20 years ago that still float around in my brain today, and if I'm not careful, and I thank God that what they said didn't have no bearing on my life, but words linger and they hurt. And if you want your child to be progressive in this life, speak life into their life. I don't let nobody call my child, man. I say he's a child. That's what children do. But as a child, a child has to mature and grow up. And in that process, they're going to make mistakes. And as a parent, thank God for that, for the rod and staff. It's my job to steer in the right direction. But I don't use my words. You ain't never been that. Sorry, just like you. You know stuff that children hear today. And we ought not tell anybody stuff like that. But you ought to say, you know what? You are a child of God. You will be somebody. You can make it. You're going to finish high school. If you want it, you can get a college education. You can do it. Because words have power. You must think before you talk. Another thing I noticed is that not only did Jesus say a word, but this woman didn't say a word either. And I, and I believe the reason she didn't say nothing is because she knew she was guilty. And the truth is, a lot of us should know that we are wrong. We have been guilty. And instead of trying to defend yourself, don't say nothing. Because the truth is, the more you talk, the worse the situation is. You know, I am, and, and, and this is just personal experience. Sometimes when you want to cover up your wrongdoing, you have a tendency of telling a lie. And one thing that a lie does is that it causes you to tell another lie. And a lie has to come up another lie. Yes, but one thing about the truth is that the truth don't need the truth to validate itself. The truth can stand by itself. But a lie needs to tell another lie to try to make itself. Then after telling 15 lies, I forgot the first lie told. Then I ain't no lie on myself. <laughs> tell me, man, I'm not going to go ahead and tell the truth now. <laughs> Y'all, I've gotten a lot of the wrong She was always telling me that, um, Father, you would have probably gotten in trouble, but you wouldn't be in nobody much trouble if you would have just told the truth at first. So you must either think before you talk. Not only should you think before you talk, but we also see the prerequisite for your position. And man, the prerequisite. And man, all the requirements for holding a position that a whole lot of what I find out that church people want to hold. They want to hold a position of being a judge. You know, uh, in school now, I don't have any degree. I have college hours, but I don't have a degree. And if you go look for a job, they don't too much ask for college hours, they ask for a degree. So when I go to the job posting guard, I immediately go to the requirements. And I look at the requirements because the requirements tell me if I should go any further with applying for this job. 
So if you go to the city, if you they have an employment board, you can look on that, go straight to the requirements, and a lot of jobs say that you need a bachelor degree in whatever it is. And when I see that, I immediately go to the next job post because I don't have a bachelor degree. And we see here in this text that Jesus gives the requirement for being a judge. You interested in the requirement? Here it is in verse 7. Jesus says, if you want to be a judge, if you want this job of being a judge, if you want this high seat of being a judge, here's the requirement. You cannot have seen. Now, I just want to say if I see any judges in the building today. And I know, I don't believe, but I know that nobody in here qualifies to judge. Now, I just like to stop talking out right there because we typically, as those that mess up a lot, we, we use that. Can't nobody but God judge me or you can't judge me because he was our sin cast the first time. You can't judge me. True, we can't judge you. But we can't be good fruit inspectors. Because you can tell a tree by the fruit that it bears. Amen. So when someone pull your coattail and tell you about what you're doing, it doesn't mean that they're judging it. It's letting you know that it's obvious of the fruit that you are bearing. And God has called us as believers that if you love somebody, you don't let them fall off the deep end. It is your job to pull them back in love. I've got to say that this is not even much of my notes. It just fell from heaven from some. I don't know. Y'all got a leak in the seal or something. But God just dropped this on The Bible says, ye that are spiritual, restore one. And the spirit of meekness lets you also be tempted or fall into the same sin. And I found out in my life is that too many people uh, want to go and restore and you're not spiritual enough. That's it. I believe that spiritual people or to talk and restore people that have messed up because if you have a worldly mentality, the chances are instead of doing good to that child instead of person, you're going to mess them up. And spiritual people know how to win people over. Another thing that a spiritual person knows is that not too long ago I was doing the same thing, so I'm not in a position to, to be too hard of a judge on you when not long ago I was messed up just like you. But if you're spiritual, you know that the picture is bigger than your heart. It's more than about how you feel about the situation. Because sometimes God allows us to go through some stuff to be a blessing to somebody else. Who better to tell a child that has multiple children out of wear life how to stop than those that have already been through that situation? Who better to go to one of them brothers out there on the street that's selling than somebody that's already been out there that God has pulled off the street and cleaned up on the inside than that person? Y'all, I used to go to the prison. I used to do prison business with a preacher friend of mine that, that he used to be an inmate at, at, uh, at Bono, Texas. So the chaplain allowed him to come back to that very same prison and minister to those inmates. And he would take me along with him. And I would go, I would preach, and I think I did a pretty decent job. But this guy, he could get up there, and he could tell his testimony about how he sat right where they sat, how he wore the same uniform, how he messed up like they messed up and did some of the same things. And, they, and their response to him was totally different than their response to me because he understood what they was dealing with. I don't know what it's like to sit in a, in a closed cell for three years straight. I don't know what it's like to have to get up at 5 in the morning, 12 o'clock, and 5 in the evening, eat a meal when somebody tells me to eat. I don't know what it's like to be behind bars for most of my life, but he did, and he was able to handle that situation. And nobody in here should be judgmental on anyone that has messed up. The world focuses more on the penalty of the law than the law itself. You know, because it, what they said was true that this woman should have been stoned. But they focus more on the penalty because people have a habit of wanting to pick up stones and throw them at you when you messed up. But don't focus so much on hurting somebody. Focus on trying to help somebody. Hurt people hurt people. And the only way you can really help somebody is if you've been healed already. Go to God and pray and say, God, heal me. I've been hurt and 
about hurting people, and I'm tired of hurting people, but God, I believe right now that if you begin to heal this broken heart, that I can be better suited for that man or for that woman that you're getting ready to send my way. Because I want to be healed. So not only do I see that we should think before we talk, the prerequisite for your position, but finally I see that there is a blessing in your blemish. I want to let everybody here know, know today that whatever you've done in life, as bad as it may be, you are still blessed. You know the old church thing goes that God won't bless you in your mess. And to an extent, I believe that. But to a greater extent, I believe that's false. Because I believe that you can't say that God blessed you um, with a house and a car and with this husband or wife or with any tangible thing and you not live in the way that you should be living. I believe sometimes he allowed you to get that stuff. But it's not a the house is not a blessing when you work at McDonald's but you got this one hundred thousand dollar house note that you got to pay. Now you're struggling and you got to find another job. Now you don't come to second that way no more. And now you think you just got a little hard on you. And you say that this is a blessing. No, that don't sound like a blessing to me. Yeah, see, but when you think along the lines of Jesus Christ, you'll understand that all that stuff is temporary. There's nothing wrong with having the nice stuff, but you put the nice stuff in its proper perspective. But the blessing that I'm talking about right now is that no matter what you've done in life, God has loved you so much the way He's given you another chance. You're still inhaling oxygen, pushing our carbon dioxide. You didn't wake up this morning to put your shoes on your head, nor your hand on your feet. You got your right mind. Uh, you woke up this morning and your loved ones are still here. Ain't nobody really prepared for no funeral. And if you are, God left you here to be a witness to the living. God has blessed you with life. And no, as we truth is, don't none of us deserve to be here right now, but because of his grace and his mercy, which is a blessing that God has allowed you to participate in another one of his days. That's right, this is the day that the Lord has made. You ought to be rejoicing and being glad in it because God is blessing you right now. There's a blessing in your blemish. The Bible says that Jesus rode in the dirt. Now the whole question is, is what was Jesus doing in the dirt? You know, a lot of people believe that what Jesus did was that he wrote down all the names of the accusers and their sin. And when they looked over the shoulder of Jesus and saw their name, and when they saw that they wasn't fit to throw a stone at this woman, and they turned around and walked away from the oldest to the youngest. Yeah, it don't really matter what Jesus was doing in the dirt. But whatever he was doing, he was doing a great work. And it reminds me that Jesus does his greatest work in the dirt. Don't you remember back in Genesis that uh, when God was doing his great creation, that his greatest creation was you and I on that sixth day. And what was he doing his great creation? In the dirt. Y'all, I don't know about you, but I think I'm the greatest thing that's walking this earth. When I wake up in the morning and brush my teeth and wash my face, I say, thank you, God. Because I know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God, God, I said, well, when he made me, he broke the mold. Because God did some great work when he did me. And God has done his greatest work in the dirt. And when God did his work then, he was shaping again in the dirt and in this message. Because God was doing some great work in the dirt. And I don't believe the reason God was able to work in the dirt because dirt has value. You know, even though the Bible says that I'm very best for a filthy rain, but I also believe that even though we're filthy ranks, that God is able to do his very best with filthy ranks. I mean, I believe mean, God has done his greatest work with the biggest of messers. Now, you know, I don't know your story, I know my story, but I believe that a lot of our stories are a lot of life that we have not always sat on cushion peas, or preached behind wooden pulpits, or sung in the choir, or ushered on, in, 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 for the offering, or, or served on a deacon board. We have not always held those positions, but God took us just as we was when we accepted Jesus as our Savior and began to do a mighty work in our life. And God took the worst of the worst, picked them up, cleaned them up, and put them in prominent positions. And if God has done it for us, surely God can do the same thing for whole God's But you know, our work is not really in this building, but your work really begins once you park those doors out there. Because we all know somebody that's told us from the floor that needs to hear a word of encouragement. They need to hear a word of God. And because God has cleansed you up, it is your obligation. It is my obligation. It is our obligation to be a lending hand to somebody that you need to hear by 
Christ Jesus Christ. Dirt has value. Dirt has value. You have, you have value. Dirt has value because without dirt, we wouldn't have planted trees. And if we didn't have planted trees, we would not have oxygen. So you need dirt. But in order to have healthy plants, you need to add a little bit of fertilizer to that dirt because what fertilizer does is it helps plants grow. Y'all, my, my, my dad cuts yards for a living, so one day I went and worked with him, cut yards, and he was working on a flower bed. So he said, little man, go and get that bag of mulch off the back of the truck and bring it to the flower bed. So I took the mulch, brought it to the flower bed, and when I opened the bag, it let out this horrible smell. I said, oh, Lord, what is that smell? He said, boy, that is some, I mean, he said, boy, that is some mess. <laughs> Y'all, I can't really say what my dad said, but you know, you get the picture. And you know that mess stinks. I mean, y'all said, now what did they say? You know, what they do is they, 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 they take the cow mess and they mix it with some other stuff so when you put it on the flower that all this mess makes the plant strong. So, so you know, that's why some plants are stronger looking than other plants because you put a little bit more mess on that plant than you did on that plant. And y'all, I thank God today that he allows some mess to come into our lives today. Because if it was all that mess that you've been through, I know it's stuff. It didn't smell good, nor did it feel good, but God used all that mess to make you as strong as you are right now. And you can stand and let the world know, no matter what come my way, I will stand. You can't move me from what God has placed me. My faith is so strong because if God brought me out of the mess on yesterday, surely God can deliver me from the mess that I'm going through right now. So mess helps us grow. And if there's a reason that you ought to praise God today that he didn't kill you while you was in your mess. You can bless the Lord today because in your mess, even though people turned their back on you, God did not turn your back on you. Y'all not like this because look at what this woman at, 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 at the picture that John is painting here in the Bible. John is really showing us a court scene to what this woman is on trial. And Jesus is really the ultimate judge. And the prosecutors brought this woman to Jesus' cross, and they gave her a, 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 a wrongdoing. They said, the reason this woman is on trial today is because this woman was doing something she should not have been doing. She was committing adultery. Now, according to the law books, I went back to the law of Roe versus Wade or whatever law that they pulled and say that this sin was the response back then. And since they responded to it this way back then, you must respond to it right now. But can I let somebody know that Jesus know all of the books that were written back then? As a matter of fact, he was the author of all those books. So it's not that Jesus was able to find loopholes, but the Lord giver was able to extend the law. And Jesus says, I tell you what, y'all, I'm gonna pardon this woman. If she's guilty, she's wrong. I'm not making it all right for you to go out and commit a judge woman, but what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you another chance. So Jesus pardoned this woman. And when, and, and when everybody left that, she was left right along with Jesus Christ. Jesus said, well, where are everybody that accused you? And the woman said, they all have left me. And Jesus said, well, I don't accuse you no more. Now, he didn't leave it right there, but he told her to go and sin no more. Because truth be told, that if you keep doing what you're doing, eventually your sin is going to catch up with you. But because God loves you so much, he's going to give you another chance to get it right with him. And I thank God today that he gave me another chance to get it right with him. And God is still giving all of us another chance to get it right with him. And the reason we can get it right with God on today is because of the work that Jesus Christ did over 2,000 years ago. Jesus says, I know you're guilty. I know you messed up. I know you don't deserve it. But because of the, the sin that you committed has too much of a bond, you can't bear your no way out of this situation. You can't go and
listen to whatever chance God has given me. God, I'm a living witness that I've messed up so much. I've messed up money. I've messed up relationships. I've messed up with my family. I've messed up with friends. I've messed up so much in my life, but God has given me another chance. But you know the sad testament about the whole situation with me is that if I go back and do the same thing, and that's the problem with a lot of us. We come, this man, he showed me his outline, he showed me his study habits, he labored in the word of God that you can be more productive children of God. Yeah. So that you don't have to keep falling into the same ruts over and over and over again. But what do you do with all of that word that God is giving you? What do you do with it? Father, we thank you right now for your word. God, I'll be the first to say that I'm sorry. Because I haven't handled everything the right way. Instead of showing love to your people, God, I haven't always shown love. I've talked about those, God. I've mistreated people, God. But I want to be like Jesus. I want to treat people the way that Jesus treats people. And God, I pray today for your children of God that we begin to treat people the way that you have instructed us. Do your word to treat. God, there may be somebody here today that heard your word, God, and don't know you. God, I pray today that you would con convict their hearts, Father, yeah. that they would begin to have a relationship with you, and we'll shout about all of eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone say amen. Yeah. Yeah. At this time, we are scared to pray for somebody here today. You may have been like this woman. You've been caught in your sins. 